room besides welcoming, welcoming you to our panel, the, the round table, round table and panel, <laughs> Planting France, Planting Empire. I should inform you that we are being recorded, so you should know that if you plan on asking questions. And don't talk about your dean. participants and speakers. Each one will present a uh, work to you in turn, and then they will have a brief exchange with each other over their work and then turn it to you. The intention is to give a lot of time in this uh, presentation to interaction with the audience. Unfortunately, we are bereft of two of our speakers, as you see here on the screen. Uh, two of our speakers, Professor Lori Wood and Megan Roberts, could not join us either unforeseen circumstances. Very well, so I will present the speakers one by one, and um, then as a block, one after the other, and then they will come up and speak. So our first speaker will be Ms. Elizabeth Hyde, which is the Acting Associate Dean and Professor of History at Kane University in New Jersey. She is the editor of the journal Studies in the History of Gardens and Design Landscapes, which was founded in 2020 and also a senior fellow at the Dumbarton Oaks Research Library and Collection of Harvard University. Her first book was entitled Cultivated Power, Flowers, Culture, and Politics in the Reign of Louis XIV, and it came out of the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2005. Her most recent book is with Bloomsbury, which came out in 2013, was re-edited in 15, and it is an edited collection entitled The Cultural History of Gardens in the Renaissance, 1400-1650. She has published abundantly in the areas of gardens, plants, botanical science, and landscaping, including at least seven essays and articles just in the last two years on such topics as the 14th political and strategic landscaping, the notion of picturesque in landscaping, plants and cultures, and on Henri Michaud and his North American sojourn, which is at the center of her talk today. Julia Ann Landover is Associate Professor of History at Montclair State University, also in New Jersey. She is the recipient of the Hillwood Estate and Museum, Washington, D.C. Scholar in Residence Fellowship, a John Carter Brown Library Collaborative Cluster Fellowship, Elizabeth Heath, and a Omo Mundro Institute Lapidus Initiative Digital Collections Fellowship. 2020, and is currently a co-principal investigator on this project, also for the Heath. The project is in the Digital Humanities Database and website entitled Visualizing the Data of the 18th Century French Caribbean. She has previously presented at several conferences on this, along with consistent interventions and writing around coffee in the French Empire. She has published articles and essays on culture, identity fashioning and nationality in relation to French attitudes towards Ottoman culture. Her current book project is entitled Embracing the Queen of Beans, How Coffee Became French, 1660-1789. Our third participant in the round table will be Mrin Bhattacharya, who teaches as an assistant professor in the Department of European Languages and Studies at the University of California, Irvine. After a 2017 PhD in French with a specialization in critical theory at the University of California at Davis, Green has now completed a book manuscript which has just been put under contract. Congratulations with the University of California Press. It is entitled Dissident Universalism, Universalism's Postcolonial Citizenship in Contemporary French Literature. No doubt this is going to be a much needed corrective, a new light on contemporary French and Francophone literature and on the sorts of critical apparel they usually apply to it. Indeed, in 2019, Marin received a summer fellowship to one of the premier centers for Francophone and postcolonial studies, the Withrow King Institute. She's also published articles and essays on Scholastique Mukasonga and Faisa Gene, alongside her current research that looks at 18th century literature and more specifically the Encyclopédie in the context of questions of political, colonial ecologies, and cultural identities, and as you will hear today, in relation to enslavement and the French search for botanical expansion. Please welcome our speakers, Professor Hyde. Thank you 
so much for your very generous introduction, and thank you to all of you for coming this afternoon. In April, let's see. In April 2019, many of us watched helplessly and in horror as fire spread through the cathedral of Notre Dame, uh, climbing through the oak beams of the roof and eventually up the 19th century oak spire where the Duke of Bory collapsed in horrific, dramatic fashion. The subsequent debates about its restoration have been numerous, and he did and will continue to be. But in 2020, President Macron announced that the spire and roof beams will be reconstructed as the original out of oak, an oak selected and specially harvested from French forests across the nation, requiring at least 1,000 trees, each between 150 and 200 years of age, 3 to 14 meters in height, 20 to 36 inches in diameter, all which will be selected and harvested in early spring to be allowed to dry for at least 18 months. Some protested the felling of the trees as ecocide, but French foresters explained the eventual necessity of regular harvesting of trees from the highly managed French forests and the subsequent selection of trees was received with national pride, suggesting really a dual sanctity of, of, of French Catholicism and patrimony. The Parisian quoted the deputy director of the National Forest Office, quote, this is about ancient forestry heritage, not 20-year-old trees, but those that are very old, including plantations ordered by former kings to build ships and ensure the grandeur of the French fleet. A landowner in Brittany said it will be a matter of pride if some of our trees are used. It also shows how our forests are well maintained and are an asset for our country. At a coordinating forester, we will be using a little of France's history to remake this historic wooden structure. So there is a sacred nature to the oak in European cultures. One of the oldest oracles in Greece was the Oracle of Tidonia, built around the sacred oak of Zeus. While Pliny reflected Roman curiosity with the Druids in Gaul, who venerated oak trees and the mistletoe that grew on them. Though when the Romans, of course, converted to Christianity in the fourth century, Emperor Theodosius had, this, had the last sacred oak of the Oracle of Dordogne cut down. But when presented with opportunities to remake the sacred, the church seized them, as when the center of an ancient oak in this northern village of Aruville Belfast burned out as a result of a lightning strike in the early 17th century, two chapels were constructed inside. The tree became a pilgrimage site and masses continue to be celebrated in it twice a year. More recently, French oak stands have been hailed as a source of lumber for French wine casks that are an essential part, of course, of the constellation of factors contributing to the excellence of French wine. But the veneration of the oaks destined for the 21st century repair of Notre Dame seems to be of a different patriotic sort. This is the veneration of the triumph of the state in managing its forests a la Colbert and the emergence of French forestry. Journalists were invited to witness, uh, to witness the selected trees um, being felled, um, and these journalists then repeated assertions, as I've already quoted, and, and continued that the trees had been managed and harvested for centuries, explaining that since Louis XIV's minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, had planted many of these forests beginning in 1669, rather, um, as a part of a project um, to, uh, to choose to protect and to plant forests to become a source for wood to build warships in, in specific growing conditions to encourage straight growth for ship building. This history is not wrong, but of course it's part of a far more complicated geopolitical story. By the middle of the 17th century, Louis XIV and his first minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, decided that circumstances around the depletion of French forests were indeed urgent enough to warrant the creation of official royal policy concerning French natural resources. And in 1669, Colbert issued the edict that you see here. His policies included intentional plantation of oak stands in royal forests, including the Forêt de Tonce and the Forêt de Berset. Um, royal forest management included specifically the plantation of oaks in calculated proportion to beech trees, three beeches to every oak, to encourage straight and tall growth, followed then by the periodic harvesting of mature trees. Colbert's ordinances were in keeping with his larger efforts to exert control over the French economy and state, and they were interpreted as such. 
Control over trees would emerge as a site of contention with both the nobility and the church, and the church in battles over royal centralization of power that would, that would continue through to the revolution. Just as complicated was the fact that attempts to regulate were caught between politics of economy and politics of the military, iron forges, progress, desire to encourage proto-industrial endeavors required at this stage wood fuel, while the military needed timber. Competing interests that had been noted as early as 1721 by Ray in his reflections on the state of the woods of the kingdom that he presented to the academy. Efforts of this sort and resistance of such efforts were not unique to France. Similar policies were attempted in Sweden with similarly mixed success. And there were British presidents too, of course. The question of control of trees was a politically sensitive one within the American colonies. The British had raised the ire of American colonists, particularly in northern New England, over George III's claiming of the best American timber for his own navy. Therefore, trees were a site of contested power, the power to regulate, the power to control natural resources, and the right to profit from them. Thus, the encyclopedia entry on forests and waters dealt extensively with matters of jurisprudence, exactly the kind of issues that Colbert was concerned with around property, around private property, the very matter around which many French people contested the power of the state, the right of the king to claim control of the forest's ownership over the most valuable trees. Pierre Dauventon's essay on oaks in the Encyclopédie, however, suggests a French perception that from a civil cultural perspective, the French were playing catch-up by the middle of the 18th century to the English, and they referred readers to the works of John Evelyn and Philip Miller and other horticultural um, and, 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 and gardening texts, uh, which of course must be read in geopolitical context. English naval superiority um, facilitated by English ability to exploit colonial American tree stands was at the heart of this concern. Back in the 17th century, Colbert had actually sent commissioners to Canada in search of trees capable of supplying French demand for ship masts. The French Canadian timbering supplied mainly domestic needs and inconsistent quality led the French Navy to cease the importation of them after 1731. But even after, but after rather the Seven Years' War, the two main arms of the colonial machine, the Maison du Roi and the Ministry of the Navy and the Colonies, the Maison du Roi representing direct interests and concerns of the King, the Ministry of the Navy and the Colonies actually having the bureaucratic te tentacles to carry it out, both targeted the problem of naval timber supplies with an emphasis on oak. And both looked to American tree stands. American plants, shrubs, and trees were highly fashionable, and French elites maintained collections of American specimens in their gardens. After the new United States um, declared independence from Britain and sought, of course, an alliance with the French, the French immediately seized this as an opportunity to exploit the partnership um, to get into the get access to American natural resources. Um, first, by commanding their consuls to buy American plants and trees and then gathering samples of them themselves. Hector Saint Jean de Prevacour was granted a consulship after presenting on Earth, North America at Versailles and made a correspondent of the Academy of Sciences charged with gathering American wood samples and on his return, uh, excuse me, on his return to the US. In 1784, he sent lumber samples to the Secretary of the Navy. Um, from which came a report to the Academy of Sciences. And that report, essentially an analysis of a commentary on the contents of Crevacore's samples, included a discussion of the qualities and uses of, of the wood, its weight, its density, the utility of eight different American oak species. They concluded that North America held great arboreal potential for the French. So the French sought to get the Americans to gather the plants for them. Crevacore proposed that the Americans establish botanical gardens in the United States to which the French would contribute specimens in exchange for American plants. By 1785, no American botanical gardens had been realized and fearing that even the Holy Roman Emperor was getting the botanical jump on them, Louis XVI dispatched on botanist Andre Michaud to gather North American trees that would find a happy culture in France replenishing French forests to enable the construction of that French Navy. In over a decade exploring North America and gathering its trees and plants and nursery gardens he established in Hoboken, New Jersey, and in Charleston, South Carolina, Michaud not only studied them, but sent thousands of specimens 
back to royal collections at the Trianon at Rambouillet and the Jardin du Roi. He returned in France to oversee the publication of two volumes here are uh, just absolutely fabulous <laughs> examples of the specimens that he gathered um, that are still <clears throat> that are still extant today. He returned to oversee the publication of two volumes, his History of American Oaks and the North American Flora. Within his History of Oaks, Michel addressed matters of French and American political, political economy, noting the impact of specific trees, their use in buildings, their um, use in, in bipedal rights, their use in tanning, fencing, basketry even, and of course, shipbuilding. Michel did note American usage, ill usage, of their timber wealth in a way that acknowledged American habits and patterns of timber usage um, that would result, um, as he feared, um, in the depletion of American forests, just like the French. Michel understood that empire building, be it on behalf of the French or the Americans, meant gathering knowledge, not only about the rich and varied North American plant life and the means by which those people in America were using and developing the environment into which they had moved. Michel's history of, of oaks Illustrated by Ray Dutte, as, as, as we see here, um, reveals Michel to be a keen observer not only of the growth habits of American oaks, but also of the commercial and agricultural uses of those oaks and other American trees and plants. But he carefully noted which American oaks had indeed found that happy culture in France, as we know, and were successfully acclimatized there. Indeed, his documentation of the transformation of the American landscape at the hands of the European settlers and the movement of oaks and other plants back across the Atlantic emphasizes the significance and consequence of environmental knowledge. His work reveals the value not just of knowing the natural history of a realm, but of owning knowledge of the environment. The entire mission represented not just enlightenment as practice, as Abel Shelford um, coined it yesterday, but also enlightenment as policy. The expectation that happy American oaks planted in French forests could restore French arboreal self-sufficiency and naval prominence was belief in state harnessing practice and policy, scientific knowledge and botanical experiments applied to the French forest and the Navy. American oaks would not ultimately emerge as weapons of growth in the French state, nor would they be needed, as in a few decades shipbuilding would be dominated by other resources, of course. But the concerned consultation of English silviculture and the gathering of American trees suggests, as illustrated in the sentiment that resurfaced around the selection of trees for Notre Dame, that part of what is being um, venerated here is a belief, or perhaps wishful hope, well-placed or not, in a state's ability to harness knowledge to properly engage with the natural environment. In the 21st century, we too venerate trees, the oldest, the tallest, we see individual trees as part of our historical memory, drawing us to the spiritual ancient roots of our civilizations, like the royal oak in Britain sheltering Stuart Kings on the run, or the angel oak in Charleston, South Carolina, said to be populated with the spirits of the enslaved. We lament when they die, noting that they serve witness to our history, as in the Basking Ridge oak, as eyewitness to George Washington's command of revolutionary troops. core of it filled with concrete as they had tried over the decades to, to save it. Or the sentinel oak, shown here, one of, <coughs> one of the oldest and tallest oaks in the Foyer de Chance, planted by Colbert in the 17th century. At this particular moment, at least, bearing arboreal testimony to the cultivation of the oak as patrimony. Thank you.